here's kind of an unusual comma training form I've been working really hard these days. So I thought I'd make a video on it and focus on this aspect. And what you'll notice is there's a lot of flipping around of the weapon from one grip to another. You do that throughout this entire form. I'll give you a much better view of that, but that was just to get us started. Also, you know I love antique weapons, so my comma are not just kind of modern store-bought ones, although I do have that kind of too. I got these on eBay, and they are a hefty, really awesome old pair. The metal on the blade is thicker than normal, the blades are broader than normal, and some kind of repurposed metal, maybe. And then on top of that, they have those weird clipped points, if you'll notice. Still sharp, and you could still stab with them, but somebody went to the trouble of chopping that down. You can really see it here on the left. That is not something I associate with a typical comma blade. And I assume they did that so that you don't have something like this. Here's an antique pair, at least it claims to be an antique pair, uh, online, very expensive too. If I was convinced they were antique, I'd buy them. Looks pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, I think somebody clipped the point for training purposes because one of the things I'm going to talk about today is how dangerous of a weapon this is to train with. And the thing with comma, as you'll notice here, I'm going to go slow-mo, is that the weapon, you know, the most dangerous part of it, the cutting edge, is often pointing back at you, the user. It just naturally orients itself that way, and you know, is that a perfect design for a weapon? Well, of course not, but this is a utilitarian object that was used as a weapon. For farm work, it was specifically designed so that the cutting edge comes towards you as you cut through things. So this evolution took place from farm to fighting to actual battlefield, and anyway became a classic of modern kabuto and that kind of thing. Mm. They're real popular with gymnastics competitions that pretend to be martial arts related, which is why garbage like this is now mass-produced, uh, made to be as light as possible for all your fancy twirling, uh, couldn't cut a stick of butter. Here are some apparently bedazzled ones, uh, so you can really impress the judges at your pseudo-martial arts dance recital. But you can see why these became kind of a star in that venue, that kind of a thing. Because Kamar are just kind of cool and wicked looking, so they really caught on in the popular consciousness. That's why you get this kind of a thing. My guess is that's why they're so strongly associated with ninja, who are also just kind of inherently cool. Even though the association makes little, if any, sense to me. Now, a ninja who is, as they often were, dressed as an actual regular person, that would make sense. Pretend to be a farmer, I've got my comma. What's wrong with that? Uh, but if you're out on your actual seek and destroy mission and dress like this or whatever, it makes very little sense to me. Like I said, its shape is a bit awkward. Think about trying to climb and whatnot and kind of a special scabbard you'd have to have for that L-shaped weapon. Anyway, their inherent coolness is again why I think they show up so often, uh, including in anime and whatnot. I think this is a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles still of some kind. But back to the actual humble roots, you're someone like this, you're going to use what you're carrying every day to defend yourself when you have to. And you know, metal was pretty rare in Okinawa, as I understand it, there's not much in terms of natural deposits, and you know, it's an expensive item. One thing you would probably have that is metal and sharp is your sickle, your comma, because or else it's not going to be very efficient at this job. So it's going to be one of the deadliest things you happen to have. Of course, it makes perfect sense, then, that it would become a go-to weapon. Um, you know, some say that this kind of contrivance here is the reason why staff fighting was so popular on Okinawa. In an agrarian society that's mostly using wood objects, there's just going to be a lot of long wooden shaft-type objects, and maybe that's why there's more bokatas in Okinawa than all other weapon types combined, seemingly. Very recently, I made a video about the Eku, so again, part of this overall transmission of tool to weapon. And the sickle was not just used in Okinawa or the Far East for this kind of purpose, as this HEMA manual illustration shows. Now, the difference in overall shape might be why the ones in the Far East were embraced so much more thoroughly when it comes to fighting and even actual full-on warfare. Now, I dearly wish we had anything close to as many fight manuals and images from the Far East as we do from Europe, but here's a great one, and it's comma, single comma, versus sword. If you need more evidence of, again, how much more thoroughly this kind of thing was embraced in Japan and Okinawa, etc., just look at this variety here. And there's even more. There's smaller ones, if you can believe it. And these last two images are from a great article from budojapan.com that I will link. But let's get back to the form in question that I've been working in. Like I said, it's unusual. You're in the reverse grip almost always, 
And when you're not doing that, you're flipping this thing around from one hand position to another, which would be an extremely difficult and dangerous thing to do in a fight. Hell, it's dangerous to do just in a kata, and it really is. You know, if you drop this thing and it lands on your foot point down, even with shoes, I, I think you're probably taking a trip to the hospital. And there are other dangerous to the user movements baked into this thing. You have to make sure you turn the blade away from yourself as you bring the item up towards your shoulder for a chamber. You bring it around your head, sort of. I think you've seen that probably more than once here. So theoretically, you could cut your ear. When one hand is chambered against your hip and the blade is in the reverse grip or the comma is in the reverse grip, you have to be really careful that the blade is oriented the right way or when you bring that weapon out, you could cut yourself. Uh, when I was training for my need on my second degree black belt test from last year, uh, I was in the bedroom practicing by myself. I made a move and I heard a ripping sound from exactly the scenario I was just talking about, reverse grip, chambered at the hip. I looked and had cut my jeans with the sickle. Just imagine the blade here on the left, the one that's lit up by the sun, traveling forward in a slightly downward arc and catching, thankfully, uh, the fabric of my clothes and not me. Again, this particular kata really emphasizes those kinds of positions and grips. So back to why. Here's some slow motions. You can see what I'm talking about coming around your head, that kind of a thing. Grip changes. Well, what I'm thinking anyway is that one you can have another form that's much more fight friendly and i do one that is it's much more the way you would expect to use this thing in a fight but it might be a good idea to have one that really challenges you and challenges you to reestablish grip if let's say the weapon is slipping out of your hand for whatever reason which could obviously happen in a fight right maybe more importantly it challenges you to wield the weapon not here in that motion right there which i love or there but in that reverse grip because you might need to do it that way. What if that's how you're holding it and all of a sudden with very little warning, with no warning, the action has started? What are you going to do? Ask your opponent to let you change grips before the fight starts? This turning move, however, is very different. It seems imminently practical. Use one as a shield, right? So it's folded against your arm while you use the other one extended for offense. As seen here, you're basically doing a sword and shield type move. This is something that'll come up in other Okinawan twin weapon, if you will, type katas like with Tanfa. Here's another version of the same move. You know, another thing is you might not want to always kill the person you're fighting even though you have a deadly weapon. So there are straight punches with the butt end of the haft in the kata like seen here. Now, the fight version of that with two hands for me is I'd have that right hand out in front of me again, kind of the shield, while punching with the left. Now, I will say, as much as I love Karate and Kabuto, I do think the reverse grip is overly emphasized in weapons katas. That being said, here is the one truly practical implication, you know, for like carrying it that way, striking from that position. The one thing I see is the ambush right there. It's pretty well hidden, if not invisible, when aligned properly, which you also need to do to make sure you don't cut yourself, uh, and you can just lash out like that. So if a stranger or brigand is approaching you while you're doing your farm work, you know, it could be all kinds of situations. They might not have a chance to realize what you've got in your hand. You might get a chance to flip it around, hide it along your arm, and put your arm, you know, on your side. Or you see somebody approaching, you don't like the look of them, and before they get anywhere near to you, you go ahead and stow it away in this position, as seen here. It's definitely harder to hide two than one because you can use body English when it's just one. Um, but, you know, think about, like, it could be at dusk, right? It could be getting dark. And then what if we take this concept and add that sword and shield combination from the kata? There's my block with my left hand, obviously, right there. One move from the form I haven't shown you yet is this one here. It's kind of the big flourish. And this is where really deadly techniques are hidden in kata. You get a lot of basic interpretations like, oh, you're slicing outward with both comma? Okay, well, you must be attacking a man on the left and the right. And, you know, that could be the case. It's not totally impractical by any stretch, but it's probably, in my opinion, more of a hidden move like this, slicing your one opponent in two directions at once. Something's going to get cut if you do that. So anyway, I better wrap this up. Old comma and old school training. By their nature, by their geometry, they present kind of a specific danger to the user. And yet they were very effective in fighting. You have to treat them with respect. You cannot get overconfident. The second you do, you could be slicing yourself like I pretty much did, but was thankfully saved by, you know, some denim. 
And back to this very odd and interesting form. I, I don't think it's the most fight practical one you're ever going to see by any stretch. My teacher says it's a lot about focus. Like you're really learning your body and the weapon, always knowing where the weapon is in any kind of position, whether it's extended or folded back in, always knowing which way that blade is pointing. And I would add to that, being able to competently handle this in a wide variety of positions, hand positions. Well, there we go. Finally got around to making a comma video, focusing on this unusual form, but also on this great, unusual uh, set that I own. And there's so much more to say and show about this weapon, but uh, I think that'll do for now. Thanks for watching.